All right, I hope you can hear me. Um, this is my first Periscope broadcast, barring the test one that I did to make sure I knew how to flip the camera around. Um, I'm going to wait for a couple seconds just to give any folks that might be out there a chance to watch this thing that might not be signed on yet. But um, if you happen to be looking at this right now and you're wondering what's going on, uh, this is something called Inter Tuesday that was organized by Nicole Can from the Vancouver Aquarium. And what, she, what she's gotten is she's gotten uh, interpreters from different places to share tips and tricks and um, see if we have any stories to share that might be helpful for people. And uh, today I'm going to be doing a Periscope broadcast all about... Uh, engaging visitors of all ages, I've called it. It's kind of a euphemistic, euphemistic title, I guess, because I find that um, a lot of folks are really great at engaging young kids at places like this, but sometimes if we have different types of audiences, it can be tough for us to adjust to them, and uh, I've had a lot of experience with a lot of different types of audiences, so I'd like to share a bit about that and share a bit about um, a workshop that my team at Science World is doing with uh, a high school audience specifically. But um, before I get to that, I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is uh, Stefan Adamus. I work at Science World in Vancouver. I have worked at Science World since uh, fall of 2009, and I was originally hired as what we call a full-time science facilitator. So I might, not, uh, I might not use the word interp so much, we say facilitator here, but uh, my job, it consisted of a few things, but a lot of what it consisted of was um, being in galleries, and we have different galleries at Science World that have different themes, so we have our big physics Eureka gallery, or our search nature gallery, or... Um, like right now, our big feature, we always have one gallery that changes, so our big feature gallery right now is called Body Worlds, Animals Inside Out. And um, I would be in these galleries, and I would be sort of taking the information that we gleaned about exhibits and translating that for people in hopes that maybe they could um, have a more enriched educational experience from visiting Science World. But on top of that, um, a lot of what I did was classroom program delivery, so a lot of times when schools come here, um, they'll book time in one of our labs and we'll do a 45 minute lab with them on a subject like chemistry or insects or, um, I, don't know, I did one about dirt, uh, about uh, grossology is a fun one, about uh, basically it's human digestion but through the lens of things that are gross, there's no key to a child's heart stronger than poop, let me tell you, grade fours, it was a grade four curriculum thing. Nine-year-olds love poo. But um, I did a lot of those programs. I was when, Usually when they hire at Science World for a full-time science facilitator, they're looking for people that have teaching backgrounds or people that have um, uh, performance backgrounds of some kind or people that have some kind of science background. And I was hired during a period where they were really looking for teachers. And um, so I found myself doing a lot of these classroom workshops, usually about the first four hours five hours of my day would be setting up and delivering these workshops. And um, after about a year of working on the floor at Science World, um, our funding situation changed. We had some renovations, the Olympics came, and we weren't doing so many of these classroom workshops anymore. And um, I found myself performing on our stage more often. And something happened. I don't know what it was. I didn't I knew I wouldn't be bad at performing on stage, but I really took to it, and I and I think that folks would argue here that um, there might be people that have a stronger science content background than I do. There are people that are probably in a lot of ways better performers than me, or they are better at using humor. And I was actually hired at a time when there were a lot of really wonderful performers here. Um, but something that I seem to have the gift of that is far and beyond anyone else is the gift of hype. Uh, there is, I would, I think most of my colleagues would say there is probably no one that can rile up children more than I can, and I'm proud to say that uh, institutions that are fairly regular at Science World stage now, such as loud music before shows and kind of a concert energy, um, they really came about because of the things that I was trying out on stage, and. Um, and because of that, after I'd say being on the floor for about five and a half years and becoming one of our senior presenters, um, 
I, uh, I changed jobs, and the, the current job title I have now is on the road team leader and coordinator. So part of what we did, um, again, it was like a, a shift in funding, but we used to have a team called On the Road, and what they would do is we'd have two people that would go to a small town somewhere in BC, and they would do, um, we would do these epic 45-minute gym shows, and we had different shows based on different curriculum levels. So we had like It's a Gas was our very, very popular K-3 show, and Energy in Action was our very popular intermediate 4-7 to seven show, and they have big epic stuff like fireballs and Van de Graaff generator electric shocks and chemical reactions and uh, I loved doing these trips so much and it's so important to me that Science World not just be Science World Vancouver and that we have a chance to get kids excited all over the province I mean you know I wish it was a global thing but let's start with BC over Vancouver and um, and go to some really really small communities that just can't get to Science World that maybe don't have the types of resources that we can bring and do our do our darndest to get kids excited about learning. So I did that for two years until the, uh, the on the road team ceased to be for about another three. And we have recently diverted internal funds to bring this on the road program back and I was hired in the position of on the road team leader and coordinator which means I still get to do the trips uh, and I still get to perform the shows, but I also got to write the shows, and I got to train the team members, and I do all the bookings and the coordinating for those trips, and um, it's such a, a life passion project of mine. So that's sort of where where I am today as a senior presenter at Science World, and now sometimes trainer, sometimes expert of performance at Science World. Uh, I'm a colleague of Brian Anderson's, who you might have seen do... Uh, do an Interp Tuesday session a few Tuesdays ago, but he, um, he and I have very different styles, and he has taught me a lot, um, but I feel like uh, we both have different things to share. So I'm hoping that maybe uh, there will be some tips that uh, I can offer as Science World's sort of, you know, the other guy that's not Brian, who's a performance expert, that uh, maybe you wouldn't get from him. And uh, so anyway. Something that my colleagues all are very, very gifted at is engaging young children. Um, it's just, it's, it's what we do as our core at Science World is we have young kids, elementary school level kids come to the building, we have lots of big exciting things, and uh, we have these shows at our stage, we have our classroom workshops, and they're all very tried and true, very well tested, very beloved, and... Um, all of the staff here are really, really great at delivering to that kind of an audience. But every now and then, you get an audience that's not what you expect. It's not that usual uh, K-7 to crowd. And we learned this from doing on the road that sometimes we would have high school-specific shows or middle school-specific shows or high school-specific workshops that we deliver. And it can be a really rude awakening for someone who's only used to dealing with young children uh, who is now dealing with teenagers. And uh, teenagers do not approach a science show the same way that young children do. So um, this is this uh, this session is for those of you that um, that maybe feel like you wanna you wanna up your your game in communicating with teenage audiences or something like that. So. Um, I want to give you a couple tips, and and tip number one is that if usually when we roll up and we do a show with um, with a, with any well any kind of audience, if we start doing a show, we find that young kids they're they're ready to love you, and um, they're they usually hear the name Science World, they're excited about what we're going to do, and we really have to screw up to lose that audience. High school kids, on the other hand, are not ready to love you. They are, um, they sort of immediately almost don't like you. That sounds mean, but um, a lot of times you show up and they're like, you know, arms crossed and it's like, who are these chumps? Like, what are they, what are they going to do? How are they going to impress me? Like, that kind of thing. And um, you have to give them time to warm up to you and you have to give them time to process what you're doing and accept what you're doing. And what I've found is that 
uh, right off the bat, you're not going to get a lot of love or audience response. And maybe in their heads, they'll be enjoying what you're doing, but they're, they're not going to show that in any way. Um, it's very difficult for high school kids to put themselves out there and to, to do anything in front of a crowd of their peers without potentially getting, you know, shame for it, for lack of a better word, in a lot of ways. So hopefully they're, they're not disliking you right off the bat, but they're not going to show if they like you very, very easily. And the key to engaging, I would say the number one tip I can give for engaging a high school audience is that you've got to be real with them. You cannot be false with them in any way. They just, they see that right away and they reject it and they hate it. So a lot of performers, when they talk to young kids, they don't talk to them like they're adults. They'll sort of talk down and like, hey everyone, how's it going today? Are you ready for a really special show? And that obviously that's not something I do, but um, well, that just sounded kind of pompous, but I, it, that's not a tone that I would normally take, but in something like a bubble show, that's a very, very great, appropriate tone to take with your audience. In something like a high school, you know, high school level show about energy or something, um, telling them how special every demo is going to be, or even telling them that this demo, like, uh, that's, that's a language thing. Telling someone that the, what you're about to do is going to be awesome is a very dangerous game to play with high school kids. You you have to let them find out for themselves that it's awesome. So instead of going, that was pretty awesome, right? Or I'm going to show you guys a really awesome demo. That can be a turnoff to a lot of kids right away. But I'm uh, I'm digressing. You got to be real with them. You got to let them know that you are speaking to them and that you are showing them something on a human level that that matters and that you got to give them some kind of motivation and some kind of reason to care about what you're showing. And even if that is like with science worlds, science worlds game, we're just trying to get you excited about learning at our bare minimum. So even if that bare minimum is that I'm hoping that I can show you guys a good time, um, to present that in a way that is, is very, very genuine is so important. And, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about ways that we do this in a, in a, in a little bit. We have a high school workshop that we do that I'm going to, I'm going to tell you guys about. And uh, that in itself should give some tips about some ways that we talk to high school kids. But before I say that, something else I wanted to let you know is that um, another thing they really, really appreciate is humor. And this should never, humor should never be used uh, in sacrifice of of genuineness. The genuineness, the realness is the most important thing. But if you can somehow incorporate effective, real humor into your presentation, like they love that. You get feedback forms all the time and um, it seems like the groups that, that end up connecting really well say that they, they, they like the presenters. It's not even something like they liked the workshop. It's usually that they're liking the workshop has something to do with them liking the presenters and really appreciating the humor that those presenters use. So if you can incorporate humor and make it a genuine part of your presentation, that's great. That's something I actually had to work on. I, uh, I found that um, energy came to me naturally when performing, at, but my demo explanations were very transmissive and I had a really easy time um, sort of explaining these exciting things in, in an exciting way. But something that, that folks at Science World have learned is that sometimes your demos don't go as you've planned, or sometimes, um, you know, what you're hoping is just not what you're getting, and, uh, and that it really can rely on the performer sometimes to be the one to carry the energy of the show. So for example, at Science World, let's say I'm doing a chemistry show. And in the chemistry show, we have these big epic chemical reactions like uh, elephant toothpaste, or we have a calcium carbide cannon. People love explosions. You got an explosion in your science show, it's like people are going to appreciate that. But it's when you have a show, and I find game show format shows are a really good example of this, where you have a show where your demos are not necessarily that inherently impressive that the metal of the presenter is tested. And uh, there, I've, I've known a lot of performers that were really happy with what they did and then they, they went into a show that either had some demos going wrong or demos that weren't that inherently impressive 
and they realized that it was a much tougher sell for their crowd. So, um, I didn't have a humor base for what I did, and it was something I had to work on, and that was because I worked with all of these wonderful comedian performers, and uh, they made me want to up my game. So surrounding yourself with people that make you want to up your game uh, and try and make you the best performer you can do is obviously, or best performer you can be is obviously a great help. But anyways, um, so genuineness, humor, I can't stress those two points enough if you can pull them off. So this workshop that that we've been doing is called a spiffy workshop, and the name for that workshop came up as a joke uh, because I was actually making fun of the fact that Science World names things with acronyms too much, and we've been calling this workshop either the Science Presentation Workshop or the Science Leadership Workshop, and we needed to come up with a with the, the set name for it now that we were going to be advertising at the schools, and. Um, I made the joke, oh, it's probably just going to be some silly acronym like Spiffy or something like that. And uh, my boss, uh, Joanne, at Science World, she immediately went, science, presentation, informal, and I was like, facilitation for youth, workshop, holy smokes, it's a Spiffy workshop. And then that name just never died. It was like this wonderful joke that never went away. So... Um, the Spiffy Workshop is called the Science Presentation Informal Facilitation for Youth Workshop. And what that means is our on-the-road team, when we go into a community uh, far away from, from Greater Vancouver, um, this workshop is targeted at grade 10, 11 students. And what we do is we teach the students how to do a bunch of the demos that we do in our shows for elementary kids. And then in teaching them those demos, uh, what we hope is that... Uh, maybe they will put on some kind of afternoon or evening of science activities. And that way, Science World wouldn't be just going into communities, doing something awesome, and then leaving right away. We could leave a lasting impression and leave something in the community um, that maybe could continue or grow or become that group of kids' own thing. And um, I... Uh, so I got to I got to help develop this this spiffy workshop, and um, w the way it works is we have three different well, we have four different stations set up which are led by two different people and two of them are very facilitator led, and the other two are sort of self guided, and um, but before we get to the station rotation, we uh, we introduce ourselves to the students in uh, you know like I said in, in as genuinely of a way as possible. And we say what we normally do. So we do these gym shows. Maybe you've even seen us do them in the past in your community when you were much younger. But what we wanted, which feels really cool, by the way, when you go to high school and then one of the kids is like, yeah, I remember you. You came to my elementary school like four years ago. Like That, that feels really cool. But anyways, um, so we always, we what we've started doing is, is starting these spiffy workshops with something really, really impressive because you've got to get those kids on your side right away. Best way to do that is with an explosion, we found, in the context of science in general. So we fire a calcium carbide cannon off uh, in hopes that they'll really dig that and then maybe maybe follow up with another demo. But uh, one of the stations that we have is, is an, what I call the epic demo station and those are demos that we do in our shows that would be very cost light for those kids to uh, to recreate. So some, we have a demo uh, that um, demonstrates the pull of gravity and drag on objects. And all you need for it is a phone book that you can tear pages out of. Um, one page per demo is, is, is all you need. Or we have a demo where we, uh, we show kids how to yank the tablecloth out from underneath some flowers and a vase. And uh, really all we use are a bunch of cups and uh, balloons with uh, with sand in them for weights in the cups and pizza pans, and they're all things that we got from a dollar store. Or um, we uh, sometimes we try and inspire large projects, like uh, we have a, a a bed of nails, or, or our traveling one is more we call it the chair of nails. And um, you know, there's going to be some kids out there that love to build things, and when really all you need to build a chair of nails is a piece of wood with some nails hammered through it and then another piece of wood underneath and just making sure it's nice and, and solid. Um, 
kids go, yeah, I can do that. So that's that's a demo I really like to do. And then showing that you can lay on that and not get hurt is, is so impressive to them. Um, so that's one station. That's the epic, de epic demo station. Station number two is... Uh, we call it, I call it the tabletop demo station, and this was sort of meant to be the core of the workshop in its inception. We used to do these uh, events called Knights of Family Science, where we would get some local volunteers, we would train them an hour before the evening, we would do some science world shows, but we would have all these tables set up with activities, and each volunteer would like choose a table, and they would station that table uh, for the evening. So we sort of, the earliest version of this Spiffy workshop was... Um, was to essentially get kids to do their own night of family science in their own community. So these tabletop demos are things that usually just involve beads, cards, ropes, and um, they're they're mostly what what Brian would call magic tricks. They're um, what Brian would call magic tricks. What we would call magic tricks. What Brian would call science process demos. So what that means is they're they're not necessarily like something like a chemical reaction or some kind of science demo. But they get people, they show them a discrepant event, something that confuses them or baffles them, and then they get them to try and figure out how that demo was done and to go through a scientific process to try and figure out the situation they've been presented with. If you want to see some of the demos that we do, by the way, um, we recorded a bunch of YouTube videos so we could just say to kids afterwards, like, just go on on YouTube, search Science World Spiffy, and you'll find instructional videos for a bunch of these demos. So um, check that out if you want, uh, or if you go to the scienceworld.ca, you can search Spiffy or Teen Workshop, or there's a whole bunch of things that would get you to it. But um, Science World Spiffy on YouTube, you can see some of the, the types of demos that we mean. But anyways, so that's, that's station number two. Station number three is a make-and-take station, where uh, I think everything uses a combination of paper, scissors, and straw and tape and that's it um, and instructions so that kids can can make something and take it away with them usually they're sort of paper whirly gigs we have a really fun straw that uh, makes noise one and again there's instructional videos for those and um, for some of them there's uh, we have our resource site uh, resources.scienceworld.ca or maybe scienceworld.ca slash resources but either way it's got uh, you can search by curriculum and by subject and uh, age level and you can find different activities so uh, there, there's PDFs for how to do a lot of them on there as well but anyways there's this make and take station and then our fourth station which isn't uh, we do a three station rotation but in case you finish early at your um, uh, whatever station it is that you're at uh, we have a, a station with some simple puzzles that again if they, they've if you have any kids that are into woodworking or shop or anything like that they could make these simple puzzles and they try and solve them and again we we teach them how to do it if they if they can't figure it out so that's the core uh, of the spiffy workshop or the station rotations but while they're rotating through those stations we give them uh, presentation tips and those tips um, usually they come up organically but it'll be things like you know make sure that you're you're facing the audience make sure that your body language is nice and big and open um, try to do your best to speak clearly um, and what we'll even do sometimes is I'll say okay so I've just done this tablecloth poll showed you guys how to do it would anyone like to give it a try and what we've learned is that high school kids are not willing to put themselves out there in front of their whole class very often but they are if you're in a small group and if they really want to try something if they don't feel like a whole room is watching them usually um, you'll probably get enough enthusiasm that you'll probably want to try stuff. So that that was something that we learned through trial and error and has since been very, very successful. Um, and then we, uh, once we've gone through those those uh, stations, we'll do a recap of our performance uh, tips that we've given. And then we, uh, there's different ways that our staff do the workshop, but these are some of my favorite next parts, depending on timing. Workshop's usually about two hours long. Um, but the next thing I like to do is take one demo and show them two different ways to do it. And the first way is usually very transmissive. Uh, it's totally valid, totally viable, but it's uh, it's sort of a science world way of presenting, uh, say, like a vacuum chamber. What happens when you put a marshmallow in a vacuum and getting predictions from them, um, 
asking them why what is happening, why is what's happening, what's happening. Uh, see if they have any other thoughts for things that could go inside. Give them an explanation in case they don't already know the content, but check and see if they know the content. But a fairly straight uh, but fun demo because of the nature of the demo and the discrepant event that's happening. And then we do another version of it that's like full silly, where I ask if one student is willing to pretend that they're like a young child. And I got like a whole routine about how they need to, we want to do this experiment on a human being, so they need to like crush their head and get inside the chamber and then go on about how you can't turn children into puddles of goo sometimes, so you have to use a model, so we blow up a balloon, but then I'll blow it up too big and let the air out, and while it's like, I'll like stare at the child. It's really weird. Anyways, um, so we, uh, to do that demo in a silly way, like I, I always draw a vamp, like a face that looks kind of like Count Chocula instead of the real child's face on the balloon, but do a very silly version that gets across the same information to show the difference between uh, a demo that can be effective as a straight transmissive demo and as a demo that incorporates a lot of humor. And they, they, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about that section, so I feel pretty strongly about it. And then another thing that we do is um, we try not to shame people, and so we talk to them about how you cannot shame your audience members, how you don't want to tell someone they're horribly wrong. And if you watch Brian Anderson's Inter Tuesday session, he talks about a game we play called Yes And. And uh, high school kids usually don't want to play Yes And um, because they don't want to put themselves out there. But what we get them to do is to force yes and upon us as the demo presenters. So what I mean by that is, uh, say there's two of us up at the front, and we'll say, all right, so what we'd like one of you to do is to give us a sentence, and another, another one of you to give us an unrelated response, and then uh, the audience, you get to pick which of the two of us has to try and come up with a link between that sentence and that maybe not correct response. So say I said something like, um, what are the three things do you need to make a fire? We need fuel, we need oxygen, and then someone was like, okay, yeah, with the hat, what do you think? And they were like, magic. And you're like, oh, crap. All right, um, so magic uh, is a wonderful thing that exists in all of our hearts, and what we need to do, or what you want to do, really, is, uh, well, you See, I'm messing myself up now. But if you had magic, you wouldn't need any of the other stuff to make your fire. But we'll say we're going to use the magic in our hearts to motivate us to do this demo. Um, and something that can be kind of magical is creating fire out of nowhere. If you take two sticks, you rub them together and create fire from the friction. And uh, that can seem magical to people, but really it's the rubbing of the two sticks that creates that fire. Or something like that. I don't know. That was a terrible example. But find a way to link magic to the how to make a fire without shaming someone and um, uh, sometimes we look like idiots doing that in front of them which they almost like to see more um, and then what they really like is if you can if you if they're at like a K to 12 school and you have a group of the high school kids and you're doing this workshop if you can do a show afterwards and show and do a show for those elementary kids invite the high school kids to come what I like to do is even I'll just leave sort of the front area walk into the back and be like okay now watch Remember when we showed you the phone book drop, how we said the kids were going to be eaten out of the palms of our hands and just like ready to destroy us because we're not doing what we want them to? Well, watch, watch the reaction as, as Ross is doing that up front or something like that. So um, we've had great success with this workshop, and I think a lot of the success of it has come from our our team members' abilities to connect with these high school kids on a genuine level um, and to have a good time with them and uh, whether at the end of it whether they're willing to put on an afternoon or an evening of science activities um, you know we haven't had a hundred percent success rate with that but we have had a hundred percent success rate with um, students enjoying the workshop and we've had feedback from teachers saying um, you know, I, I haven't gotten such and such a student to speak all year, but they were smiling and laughing and having a wonderful time doing this workshop. And I really do do think the keys to that were, the, were with the, the genuineness with which our staff were able to connect with these kids and to talk to them. 
And, uh, and like I said, the number two suggestion is that if we can make it funny, I can't tell you how many feedback forms I've looked at that were just like, the comedy was my favorite part of that workshop. So that feels pretty good. Um, so, and, and, and another weird bit of feedback, I wrote this down as a note for myself, but um, high school kids, always, we've been getting a lot of feedback from them that they're very impressed by our ability to take complicated subjects and distill them down into simple sort of like one or two sentence explanations. Because a lot of what we do at Science World is that, where we take a complicated scientific concept and we try and translate it in a way that the widest audience could understand. And that's, I think, what a lot of them are taking from what we're doing is, um, I do work at Science World, yeah, it's the best. Um, so a lot of what we, uh, what we take from these, uh, from these feedback forms is that they really appreciate the, the way that we can distill those concepts down. So I don't know if that's a universal thing that, that high school kids seem to love or if that is something particular to the audiences that we are, are doing these workshops with, but they really, really appreciate that skill. So... Again, um, my name is Stefan Adamus. I am uh, I work at Science World in Vancouver. I am the uh, on the road team leader and coordinator. I'm sorry if you just joined in and it's uh, towards the end of this thing, but um, you can always email me at s a d a m u s at scienceworld.ca if you have any questions. And um, if uh, I hope that these uh, Inter Tuesday things have been as good for you guys as they have for me. And that uh, maybe you got something out of this workshop. So thank you so much for watching. And uh, this is going to be uploaded onto YouTube by Nicole very soon. So look for that if you didn't catch the beginning. And uh, again, if you wanted to know more about the uh, the Spiffy workshop that we have, YouTube Science World slash Spiffy, or uh, YouTube Science World Spiffy, or uh, go to scienceworld.ca slash Spiffy, and there there'll be contact info on there if you have any more questions. Take care of yourselves. Thanks so much. Peace.